and looking forward to the future. We now move to the more formal part of today's event and I would like to now introduce Mike Horne, a great friend of the Chamber and the Chief Executive at Deloitte New Zealand. Deloitte, as you'll know if you've been here before, for many years has been an active uh, and enthusiastic supporter both of us and this event and the Wellington business community. In fact, it's the ninth year that they've been the key sponsor, the principal sponsor of this pre-budget event and Mike, it's hugely appreciated. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. We're delighted to partner with you and, uh, and I'd ask you to welcome Mike Horn on stage to introduce the Minister. Inga iwi, inga mana, inga rao rangetera, tina koto katoa. It's wonderful to have you all along here this morning, and on behalf of Deloitte, it's our honour to sponsor the pre-budget event once again with the Wellington Chamber of Commerce. We're also delighted to welcome Te Aue, um, Māori Business Network and the Wellington Pacifica Business Network and their members are here today as well. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the Honourable Grant Robertson, the Minister of Finance, Andy Foster, the Mayor of Wellington, Darren Porter, the Chair of Greater Wellington Regional Council, and all the foreign dignitaries that are also joining us today. Last week Deloitte released our State of the State report, which considers different perspectives on reform, and it's our views on its role in a modern public sector and economy. New Zealand has a huge task at hand and there are real opportunities to see meaningful change from the reform agenda before us and as outlined in the video that's about to play. Big change is here. Aotearoa is caught up in a whirlwind of reform and on a scale we've never seen before. Change will affect everyone, government, business, society, and the economy will be impacted, so we'll all have a part to play. Often, reform can mean throwing out the old and bringing in the new. But when setting out on a new path that will make things better, we also need to make sure the journey is safe and supported for all our communities. In Deloitte's State of the State New Zealand 2022, we explore insights and perspectives from sector leaders and experts we consider the big shifts that are needed for successful reform. How do we move mountains? Big change causes big disruption, but also creates opportunity. The opportunity to create better futures. So our findings show it's important that these reforms are anchored in a strong public narrative. They take a cross-sector approach and ensure people and communities remain at the heart of change to ensure their success. And you can download the full report uh, by using the QR codes that are on all of the tables. And it's this reform agenda which we can expect to receive significant attention in this year's budget. The Minister of Finance has already signalled that health and climate will be areas of priority in Budget 2022. And the investment allocated to these sectors will provide clarity as to the key elements and programmes the Government wants to focus on and the outcomes they want to see delivered. As our economy emerges from the ravages of COVID, we must face challenges such as inflation, as increased cost of living, social inequities and an infrastructure deficit. However, we also have to operate within a sustainable debt and funding environment and acknowledging a scarcity of resources from an execution perspective. Hence, we need real clarity of choice and thought on the programmes of work and investment to prioritise balancing the immediacy of the current issues with also forging a pathway for a more prosperous Aotearoa in the longer term. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Minister Robertson to the stage a week out from announcing his fifth budget. Oh, 
Tihe Māori ora, uh, himiana namana finua uh, ki tēnā rohi a tērana ki whānui tu upoko o te ika, uh, tēnā koe kawa. In a mana in a rau, a rau ranga tirama, a uh, tēnā koutou, a uh, tēnā koutou, a uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, and as it is New Zealand Sign Language Week as well, uh, good morning. Can I start by acknowledging um, Te Atiawa as mana whenua of this place uh, and um, want to thank actually while I'm on the stage um, Kara and the team for the support that you gave us through that uh, period of time uh, where uh, your whenua was trampled on but also ours at Parliament and thank you for the ongoing uh, collaboration that uh, we, uh, we have uh, going forward from here. Can I also acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, uh, Paul Eagle, uh, the MP for Rungutai. Can I acknowledge Mayor Andy Foster, uh, Greater Wellington Regional Council Chair uh, Darren Ponta, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, um, Her Excellency uh, the High Commissioner of Australia, uh, welcome, uh, no mai haere mai. I better acknowledge Dame Lou and Manavale Winnie Laban and mention the Fale Malai. Is that my KPI ticked off, Winnie? Uh, good. Uh, uh, Winnie and her team are doing the most amazing job uh, with the construction of the Fale, and uh, it's going to be a real icon for the city and for New Zealand and for the Pacific. And I'm very proud on behalf of the government that we've been able to support kicking off uh, uh, the fundraising. But I think you'll tell by all of the comments today the fundraising hasn't ended yet. So uh, Winnie's available at the end if you want to have a chat with her. Uh, can I acknowledge um, all of you for being here this morning uh, and coming along uh, for breakfast. Uh, can I acknowledge Deloitte and um, uh, my fellow former Dunedinite, Mike Horn, um, for your support for today. Um, I particularly want to acknowledge our host, the Wellington Chamber of Commerce, um, Simon and your team. You graciously host us every year uh, for this event and it's an important part of the calendar. I too want to make a particular acknowledge of the recent partnership that the Chamber has entered into with the OE, the Māori Business Network and with the Wellington Pacifica Business Network. Uh, Paul, thank you for your, your kind words as well. Uh, this is a truly significant partnership for Wellington. Uh, the businesses that are attached to all three organisations have massive potential to be able to drive forward the economic growth and prosperity of our city and the three organisations should be extremely proud of the collaboration. Although having experienced the lobbying and inquisition of all three organisations over the years, I think I need to be very careful what I wish for if you all come at me at once. Uh, today I want to take the opportunity to talk about where the New Zealand economy is at as we put Budget 2022 together and highlight the course that we are charting through our economic plan to take it forward. Budget 2022 is being delivered in uncertain and volatile times and it does seem, yes, like I've said that every year that I have been standing here as Minister of Finance, I promise you it's not me. Uh, but this is uh, a budget being delivered still um, in the shadow of COVID-19 and if that were not enough, we now have highly elevated global inflation exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, which is driving significant cost of living pressures for businesses and households alike. It's tough going for many people, and after two years of COVID, that's even more keenly felt. And despite my fervent hope that the word COVID would not feature so much in my vocabulary this year, the pandemic remains ever-present. We've managed to protect New Zealand from the impacts of the deadly earlier variants, and through vaccination, testing, and continuing public health measures, we are in a better position than most countries to deal with an Omicron outbreak. But it's still not easy, and like you, I'm well and truly over it. However, as we navigate this challenging time, I do think it's important not to lose sight of what we've achieved together in the face of this extraordinary shock. Our health and economic response is among the best in the world. And this is recognised as such by the major credit rating agencies, by the IMF and the OECD, to name just a few. Through COVID, the New Zealand economy suffered the single biggest hit to GDP on record, but it's now 3.5% above its pre-crisis level. At the time I was presenting the budget in 2020, Treasury forecasted that unemployment would get close to 10% within a short period of time. As we know, unemployment peaked at just on 5.3%. New Zealand took a total of six quarters to return to its pre-crisis level of, un of employment, a year and a half. By way of comparison, following the GFC, unemployment in New Zealand remained elevated across a decade. 
Now, our, our response didn't happen by accident. It happened because we put in place policies like the wage subsidy that kept Kiwis in work, and because businesses and workers stepped up and battled through. In the last two quarters, unemployment has been at 3.2 per cent, the equal lowest rate on record. The Māori unemployment rate has declined from a peak of 9.1 per cent to its current level of 6.3 per cent. Pacific unemployment peaked at 10.4 per cent and now sits at 6.7 per cent. Now, actually, these rates are still too high, and there remains much more to be done to give all New Zealanders the opportunity and dignity that comes with work. But the strength of our economic recovery has meant that sections of our population are seeing opportunities in the labour market in a way that they haven't done for decades. Other economic indicators show that we're in a strong position. Our GDP is up 5.6 per cent from the same time last year. We have used our balance sheet to support the economy through the pandemic. However, our Obergale deficit for the nine months to the end of March was $8.1 billion, $4.1 billion lower than what was forecast at the half-year economic and fiscal update in December 2021. And we are now forecast to reach a surplus in 2024-25. This will be five years after COVID began, compared with the six years it took to get there after the GFC. Our debt is set to peak at about half of Australia's, around a third of that in the UK and around a fifth of the United States based on comparable measures. So as a result of New Zealanders' hard work and our health-led response, we are now in a strong position to face our latest set of hurdles, but also importantly deal with the long-term challenges and opportunities that New Zealand has put in the too hard basket for too long. The short-term challenge of inflation is significant. Global supply chains have struggled to deal with the volume of goods that have hit international ports and shipping networks as demand has strongly rebounded. Ongoing policy localised lockdowns in China have caused further disruptions at ports. And of course, the recent illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia has caused volatility in global energy and food markets and pushed inflation rates to even higher levels. I've heard a great deal recently about the impact of government spending on inflation. We do need to be careful with what we spend, make sure that it's value for money and targeted to where it can make a difference. We did this through COVID with our health and economic response, and we continue to do it today. There were and are no costless decisions. Doing less would have seen unemployment grow or put people's health at risk. It's a balance, and it's one that I think we got about right. We cannot control the global drivers of inflation, but we can control how we respond to it. The actions we've taken to date have been targeted towards those most affected by the types of inflation we've been seeing. Low and middle income households have been supported by a range of income support measures that came into effect on the 1st of April this year. We've also taken action to alleviate the broader impacts of higher fuel prices by cutting fuel excise duty and halving the price of public transport to make that option more attractive for New Zealanders. Looking forward, we need to be conscious of the fact that the economy is experiencing capacity constraints. Skilled labour is scarce in a range of areas, and many businesses who a short time ago were wondering if they would survive are now wondering where they'll find the workers to meet their current demand. Fiscal policy needs to be set with these conditions in mind, and it will be. The spending that we provided to support the economy through COVID-19 was time limited. Government spending as a percentage of GDP is actually about the same as it was after the GFC, and it's actually set to reduce over the coming years. But what we must not do while dealing with the pressures of the here and now is put off dealing with long-term challenges. If we decided against reforming our health system, we would not see lower petrol prices. We'd just have high petrol prices and a health system that's not working. Too often the New Zealand economy has been rung along these lines. Investment has been turned on and off in response to short-term considerations, resulting in a long series of chain reactions, delaying planning decisions, business case development, workforce recruitment, and investment in sector capacity. I don't believe that that approach has served our current needs, and I certainly don't think it's adequate for our future needs. Whether it's addressing our long-standing productivity gap with other advanced countries, addressing the housing crisis or fixing our planning or three waters systems, a short-term, hands-off approach isn't going to cut it. 
Budget 2022 does mark a move past the crisis budgets of COVID to a new normal. We will bring the stability and certainty of fiscal rules, but also take the lessons of COVID to take on the big challenges and opportunities and address the shortcomings and the inequities of the old normal. My vision for our economic future can be summed up in one sentence. I want a high wage, low emissions economy that gives economic security in good times and bad. The building blocks to reach that goal are being put in place. Last week, I announced the new fiscal rules that will guide us over the future budgets. This is the really exciting bit in the speech. The first is that we will, on average, run an Obergel surplus of between 0 and 2 per cent of GDP. Alongside that, we have set a net debt ceiling of 30 per cent of GDP using a more comparable and accurate measure of our debt. The underlying idea behind these changes is actually quite simple. We will continue to pay for our current spending through current revenue, but we'll use the debt ceiling to buffer us against economic shocks, and it will give us more room to make infrastructure investments, investments that will enhance our productivity, help us meet the challenge of climate change, and are of high quality. It also makes sense for us to spread the cost of these investments over time. And there is no shortage of things to do when it comes to infrastructure. Last week, the Infrastructure Commission released Rotaki Hananana o Aotearoa, the 30-year New Zealand infrastructure strategy. The report not only highlighted the infrastructure deficit, which has been building up over previous decades, but also set out the need to comprehensively change the way in which we plan, deliver and maintain our infrastructure. We all know the real-life impact of failing to invest enough in an, or in an efficient way. It's the congestion on our roads. It's the broken pipes, Andy. It's the poor quality of our hospitals and schools. We now have the strategy, the pipeline of work and the funding to start to address that deficit. In last year's budget, we outlined $57 billion worth of capital spending over the next five years to take this on. And in this budget, we will make use of the multi-year capital allowance to add to that. Dealing with our infrastructure deficit is only part of addressing our decades-long productivity challenge and getting to a higher wage economy. The government is focused on lifting our research, development and innovation performance and on diversifying who we trade with and what we're able to offer them. We want to support businesses to access new markets, to raise the capital they need and to help provide the skilled workforce that will move them forward. This includes the work we've been doing on industry transformation plans, the Regional Strategic Partnership Fund, and the work we've been doing to lift productivity through the Digital Boost Program. I'm immensely proud of the work we've done to lift skills and provide training opportunities. More than 190,000 people have benefited from our free apprenticeships, targeted trade training, and employment programs. And just this week, we announced the extension of the Apprenticeship Boost Program through to the end of 2022 to enable a further 38, 23, sorry, to enable a further 38,000 apprentices to finish their on-the-job training. We need to do more to draw upon global sources of knowledge and to attract skills and investment to New Zealand in a way that benefits everyone involved. We have been through an extraordinary period in which inward migration has been heavily constrained due to public health requirements. As the Prime Minister announced yesterday, our immigration rebalance will reopen our borders to inward migration, but in a way that embodies the objectives of our government. A green list will, be, will provide a streamlined pathway for residency for workers with skills that are in high demand. This approach will enable us to support the development of high value industries and to alleviate some of the supply constraints that are present in areas such as construction. At the same time, we'll be working with some industries via sector agreements to help them transition away from a reliance on low-wage international workers. This approach recognises that industries will not be able to transform overnight and that some sectors are still feeling the effects of COVID-19. But the direction that we're setting out is clear. Where a shortage of skilled labour is a barrier to economic development, then there is a place for immigration to lift our economic performance. But we do not intend to return to the level of immigration that we saw throughout the previous decade or to the level of dependence on temporary migration that we saw in some sectors. 
We have good examples where a partnership approach with business can help to make sure that everyone is pushing in the same direction, and Budget 2022 will very much build on this approach. On Monday, we will release our emissions reduction plan and the funding to back that up through the first allocations from our Climate Emergency Response Fund. That fund has been created by recycling all of the revenue from the emissions trading scheme directly to emissions reductions initiatives. Dealing with climate change is something that we need to get right and get right now. We all know the environmental imperative that we're facing. But there is also a real risk that if we drag our feet on emissions reductions, we face the possibility of the world moving on from the sorts of things that New Zealand is currently a world leader in producing. Every country in the world will have to change the way in which it meets the needs of its people in the face of climate change. This is a challenge, but it is also an extraordinary opportunity for New Zealand. There are areas such as hydrogen, renewable energy, wood processing, agri-tech, where we can and do lead the world, and we will create the high jobs that we need. We will partner with businesses to support them in making the transition toward low emissions technologies and work with sectors with more hard to abate emissions to develop more sustainable ways of operating. We will also provide support to lower emissions alternatives to make them accessible to a greater number of households. We can no longer put off meaningful action on climate change. The emissions reductions plans that we have created are ambitious, but they're also achievable, and we will meet the tasks set for us in our emissions budgets. Taking action on climate change is also a matter of economic security. Our economy is less reliant on fossil fuels than it once was, and the areas where the Ukraine crisis is hurting us are the areas where we've made less progress in decarbonisation, such as our private transport fleet. Increasing the uptake of low emissions vehicles will help us meet our emissions budget, but it also softens the blow on households the next time we see a global energy crisis. Economic security also comes from having strong public services. As I've signalled previously, a key focus of Budget 2022 will be on our health system. The health of our people is central to our wellbeing approach. When people don't get the care that they need, it affects all aspects of their life. And for many years now, New Zealanders have not received the outcomes that they deserve from their health system. The quality of health care and the availability of specialists differs from region to region. The system is fragmented and inefficient, with management structures too often getting in the way of the best approach to care. Prioritising issues at a national level, which we had to do with COVID, is extremely difficult working across 20 DHBs. Long-term planning in our system is inadequate, and we continue to see large inequities in health outcomes for Māori and Pacific peoples. New Zealand has also underinvested in its healthcare system with predictable outcomes. Part of this is actually due to the lack of financial control and mixed levels of financial capability that are characteristic of the DHB system. But we also have to acknowledge the fact that the culture of DHB deficits is a direct result of the chronic underfunding of the health budget. Budget 2022 will be about health. It will be about setting up a national health system that can meet the needs of our nation. It will be about setting up the infrastructure that will direct the attention of our health workforce to where the need for care is greatest, not to the vagaries our current structures direct them to. To get this right, we also need the workers that our system needs. In addition to training those we have here, the Green List process will prioritise and provide a residency pathway for a range of occupations that are in critical need – nurses, clinical psychologists, medical technicians and a range of specialist occupations. Getting the foundation of our health system right will require sustained investment. Budget 2022 will lay the groundwork for that change. Health will move to a multi-year funding track, initially through a two-year transitional investment, before moving to three-year budgets from 2024-25. This reform will provide the certainty as needed for the system to plan for our long-term health priorities. To conclude, these have been an extraordinary past couple of years for everyone. As a country, we should be proud of how we have responded. But now we need to take that pride and the lessons that we have learned and put them to work on shaping our new normal. Uncertainty and volatility are part of the new normal, but so is a New Zealand economy that is the envy of many in the world. 
we are in a strong position to weather the storm of global inflation and build that high wage, low emissions economy that provides security for all New Zealanders in good and tough times. At every budget, there's a balance to strike. Get the basics right, do what's right for current and future generations, and secure a better tomorrow. It's a balance that we've struck before, and it's one that I believe we'll do again in this budget. Thank you for listening today, and I look forward to your questions. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. supply chain woes, rising costs of food, fuel and other imports. What's Treasury's view and what's your messages uh, to businesses that are facing these pressures? Yeah, thanks, Raf. Uh, you know the old uh, joke that if you put 10 economists in the room, you'll get 13 opinions. And um, uh, there's certainly a range of views among economists at the moment about where we're heading, whether it's the so-called soft landing or the hard landing. And I think that is reflective of, of the fact that we live in such uncertain and volatile times. We continue to receive forecasts that tell us that this is an inflation spike and it will start to come down in the second half of this year. But that doesn't stop the impacts of it rolling on. And obviously, we, you know, with the actions that the Reserve Bank's taking from a monetary policy point of view, with interest rates coming up, you do have the, the potential makings of the kind of outcome that Stephen and his crew at the BNZ are forecasting. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we've got to make sure that our investments in the budget are careful, uh, that we continue to, to get the balance right between keeping a lid on debt, but making sure that we're in a position to invest where it's needed and when it's needed. I think probably the big difference when I look at the New Zealand economy compared to one or two others around the world as to how they're going to manage the way through this is that we come into this with such low unemployment. And that is the buffer in terms of what happens for people. People have got job security. Um, there's room in our economy to keep investing. Um, we continue to see you know, strong interest in the economy from offshore as well uh, in terms of foreign investment. So you know, I'm, I'm comfortable that the underpinnings of our economy are strong. Uh, for businesses, if to come to that part of your question, this has been such a tough couple of years to now throw on top of what's happened in COVID, um, the uncertainty that's driven by this massive supply shock. Uh, it is tough, but I think New Zealand businesses have shown a remarkable level of resilience. And Paul and I were just chatting at the table before. You've got a couple of options here. You can kind of wallow in, in the anxiety, or you can move forward and say, we've got good people, we've got great products and services, and we've got an ability to sell those into the world, let's, let's do it. And I think that's the attitude I hear from most businesses, they want to get on with it. What they can be assured is the government will continue to be there uh, and support them. Thanks, Minister. Now, as far as I'm aware, Max Key's not here, but um, uh, does anyone want to take his place and ask the Minister some tough questions? <laughs> Yeah, Brad's over there. He's always got one. Brad, you beat me to it. 
<laughs> um, kia ora, Minister. Thank you. I, you've talked a lot about the different priorities, but also the tough choices that are facing government and the limited choices in effect because there's not an, an endless pot of money. How's the government's thinking changing around uh, the value for money that you talked about and extracting uh, sort of as much resource as you can from every dollar? I, is that changing? Is there a different focus or is, is there more of the same um, still focus but, but not necessarily changing? Yeah, look, the, the value for money approach is part of every budget, and so at that level, you know, at one level, you're right, Brad, it, it doesn't change. Every every time a new proposal comes up, we assess it for that. One of the things we've done is a series of expenditure reviews of a number of large government agencies, and in this budget, um, you'll see uh, something that we've done as a pilot, which is the creation of two clusters of, of portfolios of, of ministers and agencies, um, one in the justice area and one in the net natural resources area. And what we did there was ask agencies who work in those areas to come together. So in the justice area, it's justice, corrections, courts, um, police, um, SFO, um, Attorney General, Crown Law, ask them to come together. We did a full expenditure review of the agencies. And on the basis of that, they then produced four priorities a set of proposals, and they're now funded for three years. So they don't have to come back in each budget. This is what they're going to do. It gives them the certainty to be able to employ people, to be able to do, enter into contracts. And that process has been great, because it's not only brought together that value for money exercise, but it's also given us the ability to have far better long-term planning. And I, I know it's a Wellington audience, so you all appreciate the detailed analysis of the Public Finance Act. Uh, but it is really important that we start to to, to look far more long-term in the structures of what we do. When I became the Minister of Finance, we had an annualised capital allowance. It was hopeless for being able to do the kind of investment that we need. We now have a multi-year one. We've got multi-year funding for health, multi-year funding for climate, and now multi-year funding for these uh, two agencies. So I think you can see the direction of travel. It's more important than ever, if you're giving multi-year funding, to have that value for money exercise right at the beginning. So, and that's what we did in the clusters. So you will see some of that change, and over time I'd like to see that roll out further. Great to have a bit of public finance first thing in the morning. No one's had enough coffee for that. Hi. Uh, morning, I'm, I'm Maddie, I'm from Public Policy Advisory my question for you this morning is, what are the government's estimates around the inflationary impacts of, of not only fair pay agreements, but also the social insurance scheme? A good question. So in terms of the inflationary impacts um, of, of both of those schemes, I think in the grand scheme of, uh, of the government's books and the New Zealand economy, the answer is not huge. But uh, in detail, the fair pay agreements, I think, are a really important exercise for the government in making sure we set out the expectations that we have that we don't want to race to the bottom on wages. And the point that I was making earlier on in my, in my comments was is that uh, a higher wage economy is one that's going to benefit everybody. The fair pay agreements are very similar to the things you'd see in Australia and elsewhere about where we can set minimum standards. Um, we've already indicated we're likely, you know, not likely to see a huge rush of them, you know, perhaps two, a couple first off the bat and then a couple more after that. And they'll be in the areas where I think all New Zealanders have benefited from essential workers. You know, I think areas like bus drivers or supermarkets or security guards where we need to make sure that we don't we don't see that race to the bottom on pay. And as I say, internationally, they're very common. On the New Zealand Income uh, Insurance Scheme, the so-called Social Insurance Scheme, this really is one of the lessons of COVID. And it's not just a lesson of COVID, it's also a lesson of what happened after the Canterbury earthquakes, where the previous government had to put in place some kind of ad hoc scheme when there was a very immediate economic shock and people were losing their jobs. And New Zealand is one of, I think, only two countries in the world that doesn't have some form of social unemployment insurance scheme. So we sat down with Business New Zealand and the Council of Trade Unions and designed that scheme together. So it's a tripartite scheme. And it is designed to give New Zealanders that kind of stability uh, for their incomes. However, it takes a lot of designing and a lot of work, and the earliest it would possibly be implemented would be the end of 2023. So in terms of the current inflation spike that we're having, uh, it won't be having an impact on that. But it is a, a really important step forward for us, and I'm very grateful to both Business New Zealand and the CTU for the work that they've done with us on it.
morning, Minister. G'day, Kenny Clark. Um, couldn't let you get away in front of a Wellington audience without a question about let's get Wally moving. Um, you talked about infrastructure investment and um, what might be coming up in the budget. So is there anything here for this morning's audience about a push or a progress or just something to give people a sense that things are happening? Because um, it's yeah been a long time. <laughs> it has been a long time, Kenny, hasn't it? Uh, look, Let's Get Wellington Moving is making progress now, and you would have seen the announcements that have been made both about the work around the Keys and the ongoing work on the Golden Mile. The big kahuna project of Let's Get Wellington Moving is what we do with mass rapid transit, and there will be uh, no doubt more to say about that very soon uh, from all of the partners involved. There's been a consultation process that many Wellingtonians have contributed to uh, and it is important that we get that right and that we get that right for the long term. In terms of the money that goes with that, you've already heard from the Crown um, that we're committed to our contribution to that. Um, the two councils signed up to it. They now have to work through uh, the, their funding systems and how we get there. One of the really important things that we can do though is make sure that the tools are available to the Crown, uh, to the Council, sorry, to be able to do what we're asking of them. And uh, certainly on Monday in the Emissions Reduction Plan, you'll hear a bit more about the kinds of tools that we think can be available uh, and the contribution that we're looking for councils to be able to make that, that we provide those tools. So you certainly see those advances there. But overall, from, from the government's perspective, Wellington's transport needs are ones that we know have not been met in decades past and that we have to do a lot better uh, to help meet them. And the, the Crown has certainly continues to be here and ready with the money that we've allocated for it. Hi, I'm Amanda Little from Export New Zealand in Hawke's Bay, so I'm here representing the regions. We're delighted to hear about the health because we, our hospital needs a bit more funding. <laughs> <laughs> um, just from an exporter's perspective, what do I tell exporters in Hawke's Bay who are really hurting with you know, immigration problems, they just haven't got enough workers at all ends of the scale, um, fair pay agreement, all those kind of things. What, what do I say to them on Monday? What, yeah. what do I, because they're waiting to hear what I have to say. Uh, firstly, on Monday, you should tell them to keep watching through the week to the budget on Thursday. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, look, as I said in the speech, it has been a really tough time, and it's the reason why we stepped up, we provided the support we did through COVID, through things like wage subsidy and, 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 the, and the various other business support payments that we did. And what you can tell uh, those people is that the government will continue to be here to support them. As exporters in particular, we've carried on with the air freight subsidy scheme that's kept planes coming in and out of New Zealand. We're now in a position to be able to transition away from that because the borders are opening up. And the big thing for, and don't worry, um, your, your representatives in Parliament make this very clear to us very often, from, from a workforce point of view, um, we now have the immigration rebalance that actually employers will, through the accredited employer scheme, be able to bring people in far more easily. Um, we have a recognition that in some of those critical export sectors is you need the ability to be able to move more quickly, more effectively and efficiently through the system and that's what we're trying to design. That if you're part of that scheme, there are commitments around the number of days it will take to be able to get you to a point where you can just bring people in. So I really would recommend engage with that, talk to us about any aspects of it that are concerning to you. But we obviously recognise uh, the, the massive impact, particularly in the horticulture industry, around what's happened there. More broadly than that, uh, um, as I indicated in the speech, the budget will have a focus around what we can do to build that higher wage economy to be more productive. Skills is a big part of that, access to a skilled workforce is a big part of that, but so is making sure that businesses can meet their capital needs. And I often hear uh, statements that the world's awash with capital, but that doesn't always find its way to small and medium enterprises who are the lifeblood of the New Zealand economy. We don't always get the technology and the adaption to the technology directly to those businesses. So there is certainly in the budget going to be a, a focus on what we can do to support businesses and businesses in the regions. So if they can survive from Monday to Thursday, um, that would be a good thing. Any more questions? No? I've got a, I'm about to have to answer a whole lot from the media too. So. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, before you go and face the, the tough questions, um, just um, wanted to thank you very much um, for your time this morning um, and for your um, uh, outlining of the, the direction uh, the government's taking 
in leading the economy um, and really appreciate that. And one of the chamber members, uh, Atarangi, has uh, kindly uh, given us a gift to um, recognise uh, you today. Thanks, Minister.
Hey Jane, I made some Vietnamese inspired roast coffees. Be way left. Possibility of a recession of, of things going more than I mean, what are your eight expectations around? Yeah. Economic Obviously, the full economic forecast will be released in the budget uh, next next week. We've already signalled that our return to surplus is a year back from where we hoped it would be in December, and that gives you an indication of just how quickly things are moving in the global economy. Uh, the IMF reduced their global economic forecasts that they made in January from about 4.5% to about 3.5% in April, so you can see that there's a lot of fluidity. I remain confident in the New Zealand economy. I think the underpinnings of our economy are strong, as I mentioned on the stage. The fact that we have low unemployment means we can enter into this challenging period in a strong position. But economists around the world are struggling to make the forecasts about just how long the supply shock lasts for. We continue to be advised that by the end of the year we should see some of that coming off, but I think everybody in this um, post-COVID era is always very wary of those kinds of predictions, but I believe New Zealand is in a strong position to weather whatever storm. By, by, by the end of the are we going to see a, a worse picture in the budget than at 5 or even in any of the, the most recent well, certainly, I mean, we've, we've well signalled that it will be a deterioration from Haifu because that is what's happened. We've had the invasion of Ukraine since then, and that's had a massive effect, obviously, on the global economy, and New Zealand is not immune to that. However, I still think what we'll be presenting on Thursday represents a strong set of books, particularly, as, as I've made the point several times lately, we will return to surplus quicker than we did after the GFC, and the shock of COVID was a much bigger shock to the New Zealand economy. So we're still in a strong position. But clearly, since December, there have been major, major changes. So just to be clear, are you signalling that we're about to enter a, a recession? No, I'm not. And I think I think the answer I gave on the stage was clear, that, it, that economists have divided opinions about where things are. What we do, our responsibility on behalf of New Zealand is to make sure we're well positioned for whatever happens. And I believe the New Zealand economy is well positioned. Did the Treasury forecast show a recession? Um, I won't release the Treasury forecast today, but what the Treasury forecasts show is that the New Zealand economy is well positioned and that we will return to surplus in 24-25. So I think that indicates to you we are still in a strong position. And you mentioned today um, congestion pricing to that question on Mexican Wellington moving. Is there a strong indication that Wellington too will have the option of congestion pricing? Well, I think, as we've been saying over the last few weeks, there's been a lot of work done, last week or so, there's been a lot of work done on congestion 
um, charging. Firstly started I think under Simon Bridges when he was the Minister of Transport. Uh, the Select Committee has done an inquiry in which all political parties have acknowledged and supported the role that congestion charging should play. The really important thing though to note is that bringing a system like that in requires a lot of thing, things to be able to happen first. Not only do we need good quality public transport to be able to, to alleviate um, some of the issues that would be caused by congestion charging, but also we need the systems in place and the work with local authorities. So on Monday um, we have the emissions reduction plan, obviously congestion charging was part of the draft of that and so when it comes time for the final plan you'll be able to see it. And you, mentioned, um, you mentioned that there would be further work on decarbonising the, the private transport fleet as well, um, private vehicle fleet. Is that an indication that that um, car scrap scheme that was included in the draft plan has made it through the final Again, plan? I'm not going to announce the emissions reductions plan, just like I'm not going to announce the budget, but clearly decarbonising our private transport fleet is critical to be able to meet the emissions goals that we've got. Who will and Tony anticipate a slightly faster time frame on uh, mass rapid transit? So they can ride it instead of their grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, look, I think all of us over the years have been a bit frustrated with the pace of, of Let's Get Wellington moving. Uh, and certainly the consultation period that's you know just been completed around the mass rapid transit options do give us the ability to now move forward. I want to see it move as quickly as it can. Uh, central government has committed funding. We'll see whether that's sufficient to meet the designs that get chosen. But we have partners here, and those partners are the Greater Wellington Regional Council and the Wellington City. Council. They committed to it. I remember on a very windy day outside the railway station and uh, we now need to work with them to give them the tools to be able to be a part of it too. It's stopping the health reforms would not make petrol cheaper in there. Um, there is a counter argument from National that while it might not make petrol cheaper, health reforms and other big spending projects will add to accurate demand and thus make everything more expensive yeah. because of passive What's the response to that? Yeah, we have to look at these things over the long term. So the health reforms are not a, a three month project, a six month project, they're a multi year project. It's the reason why we're doing multi-year funding. We have to get that started and we always in a budget have to strike a balance here of making sure that we do keep going with public services. I think you know that kind of targeted spending that's about improving a critical public service to my mind is a, a much more constructive use of the money than untargeted tax cuts that benefit the most wealthy. Are you worried that voters will, will not reaction that, because it's not like they're going to see the impact of the health next year, are they? Yeah. They are feeling the impacts of inflation. Sure, and we've been ameliorating the impacts of inflation through what we've done with the one April changes and the cuts to fuel excise duty and the halving of public transport costs. But I know that in all those surveys where people say things about tax cuts, they also say things about the importance of the health system and getting the health system right. It is a challenge for us to be able to show delivery quickly, um, and you will see in the budget that we've got an initiatives that are about both uh, the big long-term changes in the health system and some immediate health issues we need to deal with. On that, on that, has, has, has the uh, recent volatility impact on our health system? The recent volatility? Yeah. Uh, no, is the short answer, in that these are long-term reforms and so therefore we've got to put the investment in. It will be investment that goes in over a number of years and we've obviously clearly signalled that. But that was the point I was trying to make in the speech. Now, for too long in New Zealand, uh, we've avoided long-term tough reform because of some immediate thing that was happening. And you will have seen from this government that be it RMA or Three Waters or Health or Immigration for that matter, we have to be able to face up to those issues to make the changes we want. Overall, we've been careful with our spending, um, but we signalled a long way back that there would be a one-off component to the budget spending for health, and that will continue. Now, you've received quite a bit of flack uh, about the upcoming spending in health. Were you sound quite confident uh, during speech about uh, the, the need for that spending? Is that what you want to do? Is it to be? It's, I, I never want to be the person that sets what, what people will think of me in the future. My job as the Minister of Finance is to put together a program that gets that balance right of investing in long term issues, dealing with the here and now and managing the books carefully. And so from my perspective, the health reforms are one of a number of areas where I think you know, Labor governments are progressive governments. We, we, when we see things that we believe need to be changed and reform, we get on with it. Uh, and I don't think New Zealanders can afford us to delay work on health or to delay work on climate, for that matter. And just on the, the climate, um, you said that New Zealand faces the possibility of the world moving on from the sort of fact that New Zealand uh, is a world leader in producing. Is that giving us quite an indication of what's going to happen? 
Well, certainly agriculture will be part of what we talk about on Monday, obviously, because in terms of New Zealand's emissions, um, the agriculture sector contributes uh, significantly to those. The agriculture sector has already been making strong moves into areas like regenerative agriculture, which are important for making sure that what we sell to the world is not only what the world wants, but is produced in a sustainable way. And so we'll be continuing, as we have been through things like Hewaka Ekanoa, to work with the agriculture sector, and you'll certainly hear more about that on Monday. Oh look, f the food prices are obviously linked very, very closely to the broader inflation challenge, um, both in terms of things like the cost of fuel, which has a significant impact into the way in which food is moved around. Um, we're highly aware of the impact of increasing food prices on New Zealanders, and particularly low and middle income New Zealanders, and that's why we've made the changes that we've made. Obviously we've also seen the supermarket chains uh, mention the things, the gestures that they are going to take. We think that that's great, but we also believe that there's a significant amount more that needs to be done in terms of reforming the supermarket sector so the New Zealanders are paying a much fairer prices when they're at the supermarket. Do you buy that they really care or are they just trying to avoid regulation <laughs> of the yeah. What I see is that they've made some gestures towards uh, trying to make um, some food products more affordable but it's not sufficient um, and we're very well aware of that. We have a report from the Commerce Commission with a number of recommendations in it. We want to get on with responding to that and we've also indicated that if that doesn't deliver the kinds of price reductions we're after then there are other things we could look at. So it's it's all PR PR I didn't say I didn't say that. I said that they were they were welcome gestures, but there's much much more to do. But a gesture is something you do verbally usually rather than kind of physically. Is, 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 is you saying if you? <laughs> I don't know. I think a gesture can be physical as well as verbal, Henry. I think it's an interesting topic for us to discuss in depth on another day. I'm going to have to go. Sorry, guys. Health system. How much emphasis will be put on mental health considering psychologists' wait times have skyrocketed? Yeah. Look. Obviously, mental health remains a really important part of. Of, of what we can do in the health system. Um, the significant resourcing that we put in through Budget 2019 is still rolling out and is providing uh, more, uh, more support, more appointments for people. But the health system as a whole is one that continues to need investment and we'll talk more about that during yeah. next week. And what should students expect in the budget considering the rising students, cost? Did you yeah, say? What should students expect in the budget considering the rising cost of renting? Yeah, look, uh, obviously one of the things that happened on the 1st of April was the increase in student allowances and the living cost component of the student loan, which I know has been welcomed, and we will continue uh, to, to address the housing crisis through making sure we have more affordable properties available both for purchase and rent. Rent Thanks, control? everybody. I better go. <laughs> What's <in> there? <laughs> <laughs>